Hi, could you please introduce yourself and tell me a bit about why you came up to Scotland? Hello, my name is Menno. Uh, online I go by Mr. Menno. And I'm here in Scotland to support Marion Miller, who apparently has been told to come to court uh, because she tweeted hateful things. So what do you do in your day-to-day -day life? I make videos um, and I write articles focusing on what I call gender woo-woo, which is all about gender identity, the whole ideology that's been spun around that. The reason I call it gender woo-woo is because the more I've looked into it, the more you find out about it, the more none of it makes any sense. It's it's, it's, it's based on craziness, <laughs> it's woo-woo. And th there's a lot of people at the moment that are away with the gender fairies. So I'd like to kind of bring it back to life, back to reality. So previously you've worked as an actor and comedian. So you think that you've been primed to take on this issue in a different way to most people? Well, naturally, I've always enjoyed writing and performing and I've produced a number of theatre shows, uh, more on the fringe sort of circuit, so we toured around the UK. I've done some one-man shows uh, also in France. Um, and I always, I don't know, I have a bit of a jukebox brain. I like music and I always like writing songs and parodies especially because I like to take, take something and then sort of turn it on its head to show the absurdity of some situations. Um, and naturally, I always do that do that to music. So when I started looking into this, then naturally, ideas started popping in my head about songs. So when I read about there was something called International Pronouns Day, like, it's like, that, like that's a thing now? Okay. And then I thought about the Do Re Mi song from The Sound of Music. And I thought, I'm going to take that song and make it about those neo-gender pronouns. Have you found this has impacted your career? Do you struggle to find gigs anymore? Or are you concentrating on your own content? Is that going to I'm be... now fully concentrating on my own content. Um, you know, we were in lockdown, obviously, so you couldn't really go out much. So I was forced to work within those restrictions. But actually, that makes you really creative. Like, I have a living room and Obviously, you can you can order stuff online, um, but yeah, I, you just you just change your living room from this to that. I make my own like green screen. It's a bit crappy, but I had something, so now I'm gonna get like a proper one so I can up the, the quality of my green screen stuff. So that that actually is a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing that. Um, and in terms of gigs, I'm not even gonna try and get gigs anymore. Like I used to do some gigs on the cabaret scene in London, but pff, yeah, <laughs> but I doubt that anybody would book me now that I'm, I'm so public. About about it. <laughs> right, right. So it's all about charting your own course. Mm. Do you think there might be a new opening for people with your style of comedy criticizing this movement in the future? Would you do you ever see that happening? Because you could be a forerunner in that. Well, that one thing that I have noticed is that. <laughs> look, look. <laughs> one thing that I've noticed is that lots of people like music, um, and people are sending me lyrics that they've written to songs. So I think there's a lot of that happening. It's just not everybody takes the time to sit down and then record it and make a video for it. But they're sending me stuff in. So one person sent me the full lyrics for a, for a song to um, a village people song. What's it? In the Navy, right? <laughs> So she sent me the lyrics for that. I'm going to rejig them a little bit to, to add some of my own flavor to it uh, and a slightly different political angle. But um, yeah, people are sending me stuff and saying, can you do this, can you do that? So there's an appetite for it. And people enjoy doing it themselves. And I think this is why comedy or, or any form of art, whether it's writing or painting, it's, it's a way for people to, to grapple with what's going on, to see, to digest it, you know, and to somehow express how they feel about it. So I think it's a, it's a very important outlet. And do you find that the government and new uh, laws criminalizing speech is almost a direct attack on comedy and satire and how people do process bigger issues? Yes, and this is something that, you know, isn't new. Um, and freedom of speech in comedy, especially, like, how far can you go? And if somebody says something that offends you, then does that mean they have to stop saying it? Because nobody has the right not to be offended, right? And if you, if you base these types of laws on 
on feelings. Somebody once said that, I mean, if you're in a room with two people, the, the chances that someone's going to be offended are quite small. But if you're in a room with 10, they're bigger. If you're in a room with 100, someone's always going to be offended. Look, at, if there's somebody saying offensive things, you, you don't have to listen to them. You can pay attention to somebody else. And in comedy, we've always had people who, who you know, <laughs> are a bit on the edge. Uh, and like Joan, Joan Rivers, for example, I think she's hilarious, but other people thought she was, she was really offensive. But in comedy, you, you actually have a, a duty almost to push those boundaries and to see how far it can go. That doesn't mean you have to be... You know, you're not going to say, well, it's, it's, it's tricky, you know, where do you find the line? Yeah, where do you find the line? And also, it's taking the opportunity for people to make the decision for themselves. The government is deciding to decide what right, but see, we're allowed to consume. I wonder when this sort of started. I think it, 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 it became very sensitive sort of in the early 2000s about what you could say with regards to religion and particularly because, you know, you had the Jerry Springer, Jerry Springer, the, the opera. Some evangelical Christians were very upset about that. But, you know, you can't expect everybody to be one Christian and to belong to your denomination of Christianity. And if you don't like it, if you don't want to see Jesus in a diaper, then don't go see the show. Um, but then with Islam, it became a bit more like, and there was one play, was it in Birmingham? A play was cancelled because they got threats, you know, that the theatre was going to be bombed or something, because you're not supposed to make any critiques of, of Islam. But, but that's something for people of that faith. Like people who do not share that faith or have that faith, they should be able to criticise it. There's a genius cartoon. <laughs> One of the best cartoons. Because you're not supposed to depict Muhammad, right? But if you don't believe in that, if you don't believe in if you don't if you know you don't have that faith then then why shouldn't you? So there's a cartoon where Muhammad looks in the bathroom mirror and goes, blasphemy! <laughs> and obviously you had the Danish cartoons. So when it comes to Islam, you know, it's like, uh oh, you, Salman Rushdie, he wasn't even, you know, with, with that book that he wrote and then a fatwa taken out against him. So there are always groups of people that take issue with something in a very extreme sort of way. Does that mean we... we we wished, as they say here, you know? Does that mean you stop? And why? Because that's just intimidation and bullying. Do you ever find the parallels between the way we treat Islam in the media and curtailing our own free speech and to prevent offence? and the way that we also have to treat transgender ideology, that it does show up the fact that it is completely ideological. Well, this goes further, because here we're not even allowed to use normal language, normal words that we use to describe our own reality. Like somebody said to me, you know, that I'm not allowed to use the rainbow emoji anymore online because I'm a gay man who says that a gay man is a male homosexual. And somebody said, you know, we're going to revoke your gay card. So you're going to get your gay card revoked for saying that a gay man is a male homosexual. This is, this is crazy. And that's why this is, this is woo-woo to the max. Like, how can you approach that seriously? No, it's woo-woo. So have you talked to many other homosexual men? Any other? Any other gay men to see how they feel about this? Do you have much of a network? Um, I'm in touch with a, a bunch of gay guys who, you know, are on the same page that I am. But even then, you know, not everybody approaches these things the same way. Um, they say that I'm a bit more hardcore. Uh, so I have a rule. My rule is hard lines and hard ons. At the moment, we're in a situation where everything's supposed to be, everything's transphobic. Uh, you can't just say that a woman is an adult human female. You know, it's like reality is now transphobic. Some people even say that transitioning is transphobic because through transitioning, you're reinforcing cis normative, <laughs> the cis normative heterodoxy. Oh, and it's like, this is just completely crazy. I've forgotten what my point was. What was your question? <laughs> um, how many, uh, how many oh, gay, gay men guys? do you talk right. to about this? Do you find um, they've got a, uh, is the general undercurrent of dissent, but they're too scared to speak out? Or do you even discuss why your, our fellow gays go along with something that is so homophobic? Do you under, right. Have yeah. you ever discussed what the mechanism yes. is so in the subcultures? With other gay guys who, are, who would call themselves gender critical, 
I don't want to hang on too much to that label because at the end of the day, you're just the person who recognizes reality. So to suddenly be called gender critical, again, it puts you in a box. Um, and, and suddenly you're the evil one, right? Well, no, you just I'm just a, a gay guy who, who likes dick, you know? Whoa! <laughs> the people who used to say that was a bad thing were, you know, the, the old school homophobes. And now it's coming from within our own community. So there is a contingent of gay men that are catching on to this. Um, but it, it's, it, it can be a real head fuck because they feel, some of them feel I'm betraying my community because that's what they're getting told. And then I asked them, why when you think about loyalty to the community, why does that always have to go to the, the T side? What about the L? They're part of our community. What about the gay men who are speaking up against this? They are part of the community, you know? That you are still standing with your community. Um, but then there are other, so many gay guys who just have no clue about what's going on. And they're coming at it from another point of view. They're thinking, I had a hard time because I was gay, therefore I don't want trans people to have a hard time either, which is perfectly reasonable. And that's how I, how I used to look at it for many years, until you start seeing, whoa, there's some something much bigger going on, and actually we're dealing with some real crazy shit. And I, I just can't go along with it, because you go, you either, if, even if you're quiet, you know how they say silence is violence. Well, there you go. So you either educate yourself <laughs> and then figure out for yourself where you stand. So my rule now is hard lines and hard ones. Hard lines meaning a woman is an adult human female, a man is an adult human male. And no concessions. That's it. I don't want to dilute, dilute that in, in even the tiniest way because then you're on that slippery slope where suddenly everything goes tits up and hard-ons because I'm a gay guy, I know what I like, okay? And I know where to go when I want a hard-on. So, and, and it's not gonna be someone who's had the skin taken off their arm and stuck to their groin, no. There seems to be quite a lot of demonization of straightforward sexuality and knowing what you do actually want in a partner and the, the insinuation that any form of discrimination is bad discrimination. Do you mean as opposed to just having the, the right to make choices? Right, and now we're being, as gay men, as lesbians, but even as heterosexuals, we're being shamed for liking what we like. Our sexual orientation is now being reduced to a genital preference. Now, a preference is where you like various things, but you just like one a bit more. So, already the whole idea of preference here only applies to maybe bisexuals, but not to monosexuals like heterosexuals and homosexuals. We like what we like. They are the ones who are reducing, and this is my, one of my major gripes of the whole thing. I find it all so reductive. It really reduces what it means to be human. It, re it reduces men and women, or male and female, to an idea in someone's head or a feeling. It isn't. There is a much bigger picture there, and that's part of, you know, our material bodies are very much part of that. And it's so interesting when you start realizing how much of, of what you do during the day has nothing to do with your thoughts or your, or your feelings. It's your body that that does it. Um, so I talk so much and then I forget where I'm going. Reductive, right? So man and woman is reduced to a feeling or a state of mind. Sexual orientation is reduced to a preference or a fetish. Now, doesn't that sound familiar to when we used to get told that we're dirty perverts? And now it's coming from our own so-called community. It's like, fuck off, we've been there, done that, we got the t-shirt, and now you're doing it all over again. We recognize this homophobia because we've seen it, we've experienced it, so even if it comes with rainbow dressing and glitter, nah, we, we, can, we can see that. We can see straight through that woo-woo, and we're not going Back. We're not going back in the closet. Absolutely not. So there's the homophobia, and then there's just straightforward extreme sexism with the sexist stereotyping of young boys, particularly. If that if they like dresses or anything a bit more theatrical, again, so, they're being told they're actually yeah. girls. We're seeing the stereotypes come back in full force, but this time round, the stereotypes are considered to be the authentic self. Now, I understand very well in this world that we live in, we're constantly bombarded with sometimes very overt, sometimes very subtle rules about how you should act, how you should behave. And it, it's very natural, it's sad, but it's natural that we internalize these messages that we're getting constantly. 
So if people are like, I don't feel comfortable with this, I can relate to that quite a lot. But now they're being sold the lie, you can change it, you can jump ship, sex is just optional. And it's, and it's a lie. And I don't like lies. I don't like lies. I don't like bullying. So when I started looking into this and thinking, whoa, I'm like, I, I cannot be quiet. And then, okay, let's bring a bit of lightheartedness to it because it's a very heavy subject. Let's have some fun with it, but at the same time, you know, provide, try and provide some clarity. The way I, I, well, the best way I can.